Thank you. Good morning. Um, I have the pleasure, basically, of repeating my boss's speech, but in a slightly sort of uh, nerdier and technical manner to talk about some of the things we're doing here. Uh, and what I kind of want to do is just tell you what's, a, what's on the top of my mind, what we're working on, what we're doing well, and, and honestly, also where it's difficult. Because I think one of the things that's important in these conversations is that we talk about the challenges and the difficulties, too. So a quick update sort of from what's going on in Estonia and, and what we're thinking about right now. The first thing to start with uh, is any government's focus. You know, the word users, we could call them users, we could call them citizens, we can call them residents, but our people. Um, how do the services that we provide suit their needs? And the reality is that governments haven't been very good at that. If you are a private company today whose focus is on end customers, if you don't have good user experience, you go out of business. If you're, you know, if you're a bank, you're not just competing on low interest rates, you're competing on do you have a good app, does your website work well today? For the most part, because governments don't compete for their citizens, we don't have that same sort of competitive mode built into, into how we do our work. And that is a handicap that we have to get over. So the first thing which, which our prime minister also talked about is that we are finally launching a government mobile app. Um, it has dematerialized documents, there's, there's not a photo there, but there should be one so that you can, you know, check your, uh, you know, check physically whether someone is the right person. Uh, it links to, of course, our EID. It also has a beta of our government AI built into it, which I'll talk about in a moment. And over the next year or two, we're going to bring all of our existing e-services into the app. Uh, we are not the first government to build an app, um, and I'll talk in a moment about how we've worked with Ukraine. We have a friendly competition going on, though I do hope in a year or two it's the best in the world and has the most services. So if anyone wants to enter the competition, and you know, we can make some bets, I'm happy to do that. Um, why we built an app, why we didn't just go with reactive webs, what we realized is that having a software footprint in where the user is all the time is really important. There are things you can do with a phone that you can't do with a desktop using sensors, cameras, location, and there are things that you need to have a piece of software in the user's device for. Um, but part of this story is that governments are really far behind when it comes to mobile. You know, the iPhone came out 16 years ago now, and today Estonia is launching an app, and most governments in the world still don't have something like this. And so really the question is, how do we not fall behind in these paradigm changes in user, exp user experience? And, and the goal we've set for ourselves is that when we have the next revolution in UX, that we are among the first and not the last adopters. And so that brings us to AI and the question of bureaucrat. I think in the last six months it's become clear that the future of how people interact with data, with electronic services, is going to be through AI, is going to be conversational in one form or another. Uh, we have been building over the last couple of years a framework for this. You know, the easy part is the chatbot, and, and there the, the work that's now happened in large language models makes things a lot better. The hard part is in the background. It's how do you take a conversation between me and an avatar and turn that into a legally binding decision to apply for support to lodge my taxes? So to build, to build the software tools that back that up and to bring it all together in, in a seamless manner. Um, I think also we've had some, you know, an interesting learning curve. We've been working on this for four years and some of the things we've been thinking for the last four years blown out of the water in the last two, three, four months of ChatGPT and BARD, um, and so agility is really important. But you know, technology platforms are nice and good, but the reality is that providing good services and meeting the needs of our citizens is about more than just technology. So um, the goal we've set um, now in the form of the personalized state has been for some years about how we make product management better in government. And so these are some of the proactive services we're working on right now. Um, where the end result is that we want to make the experience for the user seamless, fully automatic, um, to really have government recede into the background. Uh, the Prime Minister, by the way, mentioned that we've automated marriage and divorce. There's a caveat here. We automated marriage. Divorce as a service doesn't go online until next year. So we're hoping for a bump in our statistics, uh, where we have more marriages than divorces. But I'm sure, unfortunately, the divorce statistics will catch up. What's going on in the background, though, is changing how we do the governance of services. So this is the example of getting married. Um, and the point here is that there are a whole bunch of different bureaucratic entities involved in that process. First of all, they're governed by different ministers and, and different administrations. So 
Population registry is maintained by the Ministry of Interior. Identity documents get handed up by the police and border guards. The driver's license, and if you change your name, you need a new driver's license, is a different agency. And on top of that, there's local governments, there's notaries. All of that turns into a single front end for the user, a single interface. But that isn't just technology. The technology part's easy. The hard part is getting the people who own those services into a room and talking together about how we actually provide that service, how we do the data governance, what the rules are around that, having a single product manager responsible for that end user service. Um, and so, in effect, we have to put a layer on top of bureaucracy that really focuses on the user. So it's not a technological challenge, it's an administrative challenge, it's a change in the way we work. And I think this brings me to what, unfortunately, I spend most of my time on, unfortunately, which is this vague phrase called digital transformation. What that means in practice is getting um, my bosses, ministers and the prime minister, and, and all of their teams to think more about digital. Not as a technology, not as something supporting their work, but a core part of, of what their task is today and, and how they do things. Um, and so uh, the challenge is how do you turn your minister, not just your digital minister, but your social minister, your interior minister, into a digital native? And that doesn't mean they have to code, but that does mean that they have to understand how technology changes their business, they have to know how to hire the people who can make those changes, they have to understand that on top of technology, we also have data questions, we have service delivery questions, we have financing questions, and it has to all be brought together. Um, and so we've, we've put some you know, quite a lot of effort in the last couple of years into how we train, especially our civil service, our top civil service, our ministers, but also increasingly the middle management layer, and I will say, we've seen a lot of positive results, but there's still a long way to go. Um, and this is, I think, really the core challenge, because what technology offers today, it's getting simpler, it's getting cheaper, but if we don't know how to use it, then we are still, you know, we, we get back to slow, inefficient, bureaucratic government processes. The second thing, you know, and, and on top of users, that we've been thinking a lot about, and the Prime Minister mentioned this, is, is resilience. This is not a picture from Estonia, it's unfortunately uh, from Ukraine. Um, but I think one of the, um, one of the interesting takeaways uh, from the war in Ukraine in the last year, we all knew that cyber is, uh, is a core part of modern conflicts. And, and in a way, um, the, the, the physical atrocities have almost um, sort of hidden what's happened in cyber war. Uh, the Ukraine war, it started in, in cyberspace. Um, you know, before the first shots were fired, uh, the Russian government was working its way into all critical infrastructure in Ukraine, looking, looking for ways to compromise government data. A lot of, you know, a good part of why they didn't succeed in the first days of the war is because Ukraine and its allies put a lot of effort into uh, uncovering those, uh, those zero-day vulnerabilities, into preventing those attacks. But one of the things that the, that the Russians have also done is they have focused not just, of course, on cyber attacks, but also physical attacks against digital infrastructure. Um, if you look at what was targeted, what was bombed, data centers, communications infrastructure, uh, you'll hear, I hope, from uh, Prime, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Fedorov about how they've managed their data and how they chose to move some things to the cloud. If they hadn't done that, there would be no digital Ukraine today. And so uh, it becomes existential. I hope that none of you face exactly the challenges Ukraine has had, but it's, it's really important to think about these sort of worst-case scenarios because it puts in place your planning uh, and it makes you question your assumptions. And unfortunately, a lot of the ideas that we've had in peacetime around the necessity of data embassies, for instance, ha has turned out to be justified. And finally, since we're talking today about not governmental change, but social change, I want to talk about the role of government as a platform. Um, and I want to start off by talking about two things you've probably heard about plenty of times before in Estonia, our electronic identity and, and, and X-Road. We'll talk about that in a second. But I think the point I want to make here is, um, you know, this is 64% of our population uses the ID card. The number is a bit bigger if we also factor in some of the other authentication means. That's what matters. That's the KPI that's important. It's not what's the technology, how fancy or secure is it. That's all very important and we could have long discussions. But what actually matters is the uptake, how much it's used, how many services are on top of it. So we are, for instance, right now going through a, a rethink of how we do identity. Uh, we, like everyone else in the world, we're looking at identity wallets, we're asking how we, what the next generation of technology is, and that's all important to get right. But the value that we have to hold 
It's not having the right technology. It's making sure that the uptake and the network effects of that identity remain strong. And in particular, what I think for us the biggest strength in our identity ecosystem is, is that it's an ecosystem. The majority of authentications and signatures, the majority of use cases, they are not governmental. They are private sector. People you know, authenticating for their bank, people signing employment contracts. And so having a single platform used by government and the private sector is what has enabled us to get to this point where, for Estonia, the identity question is solved. And that doesn't mean that we don't have to maintain the ecosystem, update the technology, but it's a basic piece of societal infrastructure we have in place. And that's where I think every country needs to get. And the same thing um, is true of XROAD and, and how we deal with data. Again, we could talk about the technology, and of course, you know, this is the best data exchange layer in the world. Please adopt it. Um, but the reality is what really matters is that you have a data exchange layer that is used by the public sector, by the private sector, and it's the volume of usage you have on that. It's the number of entities connected. It's the uptake. It's taking something that is costly and a massive source of friction, which is setting up data exchanges between multiple parties managing the security, and putting that all behind an API, making it simple and routine and easy to manage. And so again, XROAD, we are migrating to you know, a new concept, X rooms, which will allow us to push data proactively, to, to, use, um, to use the data resources we have more effectively for aggregating data while maintaining privacy. And the technology will change, but the fundamental value is that everyone's connected and that everyone's using it. And that is what we have to maintain. So one of the things that, you know, that XROAD lets us do well also is open data. Um, and so open data, of course, is critical because it allows people to build applications on top of government data. My favorite case, by the way, in Estonia, we have a, uh, our largest gardening supply store, uh, takes the open data from our weather institute, uh, our national weather institute, and they use that to automatically select the plants and the flowers they're going to grow 14 days in advance. Because they know what the weather's going to be, they know how that affects consumer behavior, and then they have the plants that people actually want to buy and that will grow in that weather. Um, and open data is super important, but it's not enough. Because a lot of the really valuable data that we are all sitting on as governments is far too sensitive to ever make to open up. And, and no amount of privacy scrubbing, privacy enhancing technologies will change that. Medical data, location data, you know, all sorts of data on how the social welfare state works um, is deeply sensitive, but also deeply valuable to building services. And so how do we bridge this gap? Well, one of the ways to do it is through consent. So something that we're rolling out right now is a consent management service that allows uh, citizens to share their data with private sector providers um, and to share it not just once, but an ongoing live feed. And so the, the first use cases, they're, they're practical and they're simple. Um, uh, I applied for a home loan last year. I shared my tax data directly uh, with the bank through a, you know, a little consent service that looks like this, and then I didn't have to upload my income statement. The bank had an easier time verifying it. You know, we've done the same thing for, for vaccination information, which thankfully right now is a little bit you know, less crucial. But as we start moving toward personalized medicine, as the Prime Minister talked about, if we think about the services we need for the Green New Deal, how we nudge our businesses and our citizens to behave differently, all of this data sharing will be increasingly important, and we can't do it all through open data. Let me then get to something we've talked about before, which is AI. All I want to say here is we're working on it, we've been working on it for a number of years, and our minds continue to be blown. Um, and we have to constantly reevaluate our assumptions. The good news is, if you're behind on AI, if you've done nothing, this is the best time in the world to start. Because basically everyone who's been building applications, et cetera, is also restarting. And, and that point about learning constantly, I think, brings me to what is the most important message today when I think about what we've done and what our journey is and, and, and what our conversations with everyone in this room are. And that is humility. Um, you know, E-Estonia, in addition to, I think, you know, doing the right things and being good on content, we have a good hype machine. I'll be honest about it, uh, and it's true mostly. But what gets lost there is that we don't have all the answers. We don't have it figured out, and, and doing this stuff well is hard for us too. You know, the administrative processes, dealing with legacy, all the, everything along the full stack, we struggle as much as everyone else. It's never going to be easy. Um, and given that, there's no point doing this alone or pretending that any one place has it all figured out. So I think we are much stronger when we do all of our work together. Um, and I just want to give a couple of examples of this. So something that is incredibly important for us 
is, is taking the platforms and technologies we've built and open sourcing them. And not just letting others take what we've built, but actually building it together. Um, bringing product requirements and ideas to the table that we may not have ourselves. So the, the one way we do that is, is with NIES, the Nordic Institute for Interoperability Studies, uh, sorry, Solutions, um, co-owned by Estonia, Finland, and Iceland. That's how we procure new versions of the open source X-Road. I'm very proud that after Estonians, the second largest, com number, or the second largest community on the NIES platform is Colombians, uh, not Finns or, or Icelanders, um, and, and it's used across the world. Um, but it's not enough just to share what you've done. It's also the hard part, the muscle we all have to build, is reusing what others have done. So to put our money where our mouth is, we've been working with the last year uh, with the Ukrainian government. Um, the, the, the background of the story is wonderful. The eGovernance Academy has been present in Kyiv for the last 10 years, and a lot of the really fantastic work that the Ukrainian government has done in the last decade has been based on Estonia. And they've copied a lot of things, and they've had the openness to really ad adopt what we've done, and that's gotten to the point where some things they've implemented, I would say, better than we have, because they started later, because they leapfrogged us. So Ukraine, based on many of the principles of e-Estonia, I always have to say, but they got to a mobile government application before we did. And so we're thinking, you know, we, we have to build our own. Do we reinvent the wheel, or do we work with Ukraine? Do we take some of the code? Do we work closely with the teams? I know that Slava from, uh, from Ukraine, there he is. Uh, Slava is sort of a constant contact of mine and my team, and, and we've really had a, a melding of minds in the last year. And I think that's the way it should be. We have to learn from each other. We have to do this together. I, I hope that in the next year or two, we'll have a slide, you know, for, for mobile government applications that's similar to the knee slide, where we're building it together as a product. So just to round off, I want to mention also GovStack. It's an ITU initiative. Uh, with a lot of different participants where we are on a global level working on joint specifications and implementations for e-government components. And I think that's where some of the ideas that NIES has had, uh, that we've had with Ukraine, come together into a global initiative. And I finally ha do have to plug the European Union. Um, a lot of these things that have to happen globally, we're also doing in Europe. We're doing it in a very intense way. There's a lot of funding and resources coming to bear on it. Um, and, of course, Europe does have, uh, you know, does give itself the mandate of making these things not only open to its own members, but to the world as a whole. So, uh, please watch the European space, too. Uh, and with that, I've gone over my time. Um, I'm delighted that you're all here. I hope that we can talk, that we can uh, put our minds together, because together we are stronger. Um, and with that, I give the floor back to Hannes, yes? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.